This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. This is a non-commercial broadcast, so we've shied away from asking viewers to subscribe or follow us. However, having subscribers, which is free, helps us to gain support from grant agencies and to continue this series. So if you like us, please tap or click the red subscribe button on YouTube on the lower right-hand side of your screen or the follow button on your podcast. This talk is with two scholars. First, Agnès Lafon, who is a member of the Institute for Research on the Renaissance, the Neoclassical Age, and the Enlightenment, IRCL, at the University of Montpellier III. And second, Lindsay Reed, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Galway. They are currently collaborating as editors for a forthcoming Revels edition of The Maid's Metamorphoses, which is a little-known late Elizabethan play about sex and gender identity. This talk is made possible with support from the Aoyama Gakuin Institute of the Humanities. Agnes and Lindsay, the work that both of you do can never be accused of lacking erudition. Agnes, your work on the reception of classical myths in Renaissance England is superb, and you also work on the plays of Shakespeare, his contemporaries, and also the poetry of the period with a great interest in Ovid and the influence of Ovid and other classical models on uh, those people during the early modern period, both in France and in England, and of course, free French rewritings of uh, Ovid that shaped English recep the reception of Ovid during that period. Lindsay, your primary research and teaching interests include early modern literature, classical poetry, mythology, adaptation, and reception studies, broadside ballads, and early pr English print culture. You also work on the reception of the classics during the early modern period and have published abundantly also on the topic of Ovid's recep reception during this period and on Shakespeare's Ovid and other things. So the reason we invited the two of you here is first to ask you about the recent work you've collaborated on, specifically The Maid's Metamorphoses, a late Elizabethan play about sex and gender identity. With the keyword metamorphosis in the title, we know that we will strongly feel the presence of Ovid, which both of you, uh, Ovid is something that both of you have worked on. So, Agnes, may, may we ask you first for a description of the work that you're doing with Lindsay. Um, yeah, thank you for your kind uh, introduction, Tom, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, Lindsay and I um, both come from the field of classical reception. Both uh, share this interest for Ovid, erotic mythology, <laughs> and Renaissance culture. And so this pastoral play was indeed a, a wonderful um, opportunity to work um, together. And it all started really um, because we wanted to make that anonymous play available for teaching and for um, discussion um, for, for the community. And so, um, as you said, the, the play uh, dating back 1600 um, was um, published uh, as an anonymous play and first performed by the children of Paul's. And so it's, it's kind of a standard uh, play in length, uh, 1900 uh, lines or so, uh, but it, it's a bit, it's rhymed decasyllables and prose. And indeed it centers around this, the story of um, Eurymini um, being transformed into a man in act three um, to avoid being sexually assaulted. Um, by Apollo, and then retransformed into a girl at the end of the play, so she can live uh, happily ever after with Ascanio, her, her lover. So why that play? Um, why we chose that play? Um, yeah, it speaks to contemporary students as well as, as to, um, to us. Um, gender identity, uh, quite radically explored for, for the period because we have this change on stage. Um, this really surprises um, and pleases students really, and helps us frame our discussion in, in a sort of safe space because it's 
it's distant in the past. So, right. So that's the, the first reason why, why we were attracted um, to that play. That's, it's also a fun play, right? Uh, fun because um, it's kind of a fairy tale play. The pastoral um, is conducive to like sort of humor um, and, and well-known um, elements that the student recognize. Uh, for instance, the beginning of the play starts, you know, Eurimini is led um, to the forest by two wicked courtiers who obey the Duke's command to kill her. And they don't. So it's kind of a, a Snow White um, a flavor to it. There are singing competitions. There is an echo scene. But also the students find it really sort of intimidating because it's old. So it must be serious. And so the, the second reason why, was we wanted to share that fun with the students and the production was the idea to make that you know come across and the third reason is um, is a very selfish reason that Lindsay and I are sharing is that because we are Ovidian scholars we want people to read more Ovid and so uh, many stories uh, from Metamorphosis are actually uh, in that play you have like the references to um, um, Iphis and Ionsi, Atalanta, Daphne, I mean, it's all sort of, it's very rich, but it's also interesting because it's anonymous. So it's not Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. It's not intimidating, I guess, in a sense. Yeah. So because it's an Ovidian play with many references to gender bending episodes, mm -hmm. um, um, Iphis and Atalanta and Daphne, uh, all those staples, um, um, we find it's really interesting to um, to, to consider that play not just um, as an other Lily play, but as the voice of a minor sort of author who anonymous, who's also testifying of the Latin poet's vogue um, on the stage uh, in the um, early years of the English um, 17th century. Yes, so excellent. that's the third reason. Excellent, excellent. Well, Lindsay, what I want to ask you now, of course, you're in Galway. I think you're in Galway now, right? Is that yeah. correct? Yes. And uh, and yes, you're in Montpellier. So you yeah, guys, are, you know, you're a good bit apart. So you're collaborating. And I want our viewers to know I did not prepare you for this for this question, but yeah. I think you probably have the answer. What is it like uh, collaborating on an edition, and this is for the, all of us nerds out there who are really interested in the, um, what is it, the, how you do this, right? I love collaboration. I love the idea that you decided to do that. You're both interested in the same thing. You're not compete, competing with each other. You're working together. How does that work over email and communications and so forth? How do you divide up things? That sort of stuff. Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess one of the kind of interesting things about this editing project that we're working on right now is that it, it sort of the whole thing was was kind of born actually out of a desire to do something together. Um, and, and that's really kind of the origins of the project. Um, we kind of knew of, of first of, of one another's work. Um, and then we met, I, I guess, when was it 2017 or, or something like this? It might have been the first time that we met in person and we really kind of hit it off. And so in the wake of that, we were looking for, you know, kind of what is something that we could do together. Um, and so it was it was kind of out of conversation that, that we landed on, on the idea of doing an editing project that would kind of speak to both of our interests in Ovid. Um, and so we then kind of came across the, the Maid's Metamorphosis as a, a really great understudied Ovidian play that um, deserves, we, we believe, much more recognition um, for, for the really kind of interesting things that it's doing. So it was in, in a way, um, you know, kind of us thinking about what could we do together, what would be interesting that, that we could do together um, that brought us to, to the project to begin with. But then... Um, I mean, we had uh, some some difficulties actually in in terms of kind of getting things started with the collaboration because we had initially applied for um, a grant and it's a special grant to kind of promote Irish and French research collaboration specifically. Um, it's called the Ulysses Grant um, that's jointly funded by the Irish Research Council in Campus France. Um, 
And so this this grant that we and, and we were successful, um, we had applied in 2019 for it. And we found out, I think, in late February 2020 that we'd been successful. But the grant could only be used to support travel um, yeah. for these research collaborations. So basically, as soon as we won the grant, we couldn't actually use it to travel. And we had thought initially that we would be able to, to kind of use that grant to do travel and kind of be um, in the same space to, to get things started. Um, eventually, we, we kind of got extensions on, on the grant period and things like this. So eventually, we did manage to, to get some travel out of that grant. Um, but it kind of really delayed things. So we actually, from the beginning, um, just because of the timeline of the projects, um, we, we've been kind of having periodic Zoom meetings. Um, we have had difficulties. We, we've kind of used different um, systems of kind of sharing documents. We were originally using um, Microsoft and then kept kind of getting locked out because of permissions in, in one of the other's universities. So we've moved to a Google Doc system now. Um, but we, we've really um, been working through a system of kind of shared docs and, and Zoom meetings for the most part with kind of occasional trips um, back and forth. And I think we're both really fortunate. We, we both, I think, really like having the opportunity to go visit the other one. <laughs> we, we both live in sort of attractive places for tourists. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so we do we do have, um, you know, some kind of back and forth actual kind of in-person visits, but we've managed... And and, and I think it helps that from the get go, it was kind of COVID times when we got started on it. And so we, we, we kind of settled quite quickly into um, a, a kind of Google Docs and Zoom routine. OK, so as you're doing this project and you're working from the 1600 publication, uh, the year 1600, uh, mm -hmm. and that that's curious in itself. Uh, it's the revival of the uh, near what it is the revival of the uh, Paul's boys after roughly a decade of hiatus. And they're coming back. It shows up in Hamlet. There's, you know, uh, and there's a kind of, mm, uh, well, we just we're not quite sure exactly. Uh, but in terms of authorship, I'm, I'm going in that uh, direction. Uh, however, let's come back to that. Let's move forward to readings. You guys have been involved with readings and uh, productions of the project and a fabulous production. I want to start, uh, Lindsay, with you. Tell us a little bit about the readings and the productions of the project. Yeah, so one of the first things that we did with the play is we kind of tried to do the modernized um, text. And so we started out with, with and, and in some ways it's an easy play to edit because there's only one printed quarto edition from the early modern period. Um, so we, we started out by trying to kind of modernize um, the text for um, kind of a contemporary audience. And so the first thing that we did in terms of readings is we worked with the Beyond Shakespeare Company in 2022. So it's just about, I think it was this time of year, um, just about two years ago, they took our, our modernized script as it was at that point and, and did a reading of the play that was based on that script, um, which then got turned into a podcast, which, which is fantastic as well. Um, so that was that was kind of the first experiment with the Beyond Shakespeare Company. And, and that was really quite helpful to us. Um, to, to kind of hear the text aloud um, for the first time with, you know, the involvement of, of um, some professional actors as well. Um, so that that was really kind of fantastic. And, and we certainly in that reading kind of caught some things about the text. And, and was, you know, there were some things that we wanted to go back and revisit after that. Um, words that we wondered, is that actually the best way of, of modernizing that and thing, things like this? Um, but then after that, um, and and actually, I'm I'm probably not the one who's who's best poised to speak as much about this. But um, we had then a, a sort of collaborative venture that emerged with Perry Mills, um, which is is really what then kind of took things to the next level and and really kind of brought things um, to to life on stage. Um, so Perry Mills is is kind of the long time um, kind of artistic visionary and, and director of the Edwards Boys um, company, which, which are based in Stratford um, in the UK. 
um, and, and has a long history of, of kind of bringing to life um, early modern plays with kind of contemporary grammar school boys. Um, and so there's, there's a kind of ongoing relationship between um, the, the research center in Montpellier and the Edwards boys at this point. The Edwards boys have actually traveled a couple of times, I think, to, to France um, as, as part of this kind of collaborative venture. I think it's three times now that, they, that they've been there. Um, and so we were able to, to in, in part kind of build on that existing um, collaborative kind of arrangement that, that they had um, and that existing partnership, which has become more formalized over time. Um, and so we, you know, via, via that um, kind of collaborative partnership, we were able to kind of attract Perry's interest in this play. Um, and it was it was quite interesting actually talking to him as as the play kind of develops because I mean in, in some ways my my sense of it is that he agreed to do the play in at, at first in part because um, there was you know a researcher in Montpellier who was working on the play they had this kind of existing relationship um, but he didn't necessarily he said think it was a great play early on um, and it was actually only after working with the play that that he actually really really came to love the the play as well and I and I think for us too uh, we we thought it was a very interesting play for lots of reasons and and kind of lots of academic reasons um, to begin with but but actually you know, seeing it performed and, and seeing that that whole kind of performance come together um, in, in the spring of 2024. I, I mean, it's, it, it actually makes me kind of realize it's a good play. It, it's a good play in ways that you, you didn't quite know just from reading it on the page. Yeah. Well, uh, Agnes, would you, would you like to, well, I'll prompt you and you can go anywhere you want with this, but you have worked on the uh, French influence on the uh, Ovidian area where the framework of the French translations in England shaped the views of Ovidian uh, translators, I guess, or people who were putting Ovid into English. Now, here you have a situation where you're taking an English play and bringing it to France many centuries later or several centuries later. And so how did, let, let's just start with how was the reception of this in France? Uh, this very difficult English, number one. Yeah, um, that's a very good question because, of course, it was a bit daunting to suggest to have the Edwards boys, so boys performing an English play for a French audience in a community theater. That was kind of, um, because in fact, the scheme we applied for with um, to, to, to finance the whole uh, project is, is a scheme which um, um, all connects um, the French CNRS, the French Ministry of Culture, and the University Paul Valéry of Montpellier. So the idea is actually to bring culture to everyone in the city, but uh, to do it in an informed way by using a, a sort of dynamics between researchers and my research center and uh, practitioners, so Perry. So what was really, um, so, so we took advantage of that scheme, which is already uh, in place um, in uh, my research center, the Institute for Research on the Renaissance, the Classical Age and the Enlightenment, the IRSL. Um, and um, we, we got um, the biggest town uh, playhouse in town, um, the, Jean, the Théâtre Jean-Claude Carrière, 550 seats, um, and we were sold out, but it, except it was a free performance, so we were, yeah. Uh, but uh, so on March 26, we had specialists, students, and French citizens watching the play in English. How do you do this? It's called cultural mediation, right? So uh, in fact, um, been using my my class because I'm teaching an undergraduate class on cultural mediation as well, uh, to create a sort of leaflet. Uh, and Lindsay and I had previously done like a pedagogical kit for teachers. And so that tool was sent as, as a sort of broil. Well, and we didn't know what colleagues were going to do about it. But, but, but we, so it was sent by the research center to the networks uh, in town to see what secondary school teachers would do about it. And they loved mm -hmm. it, in fact. 
because of the issue also. So we got into a sort of Shakespeare and citizenship kind of project and it, it worked. Uh, so they used the material um, in English, but also my translation students translated it into French. So we also got like, as you say, you know, the bilingual kind of things, but we didn't. And, so, and we started translating um, some bits of the play with my students, but this didn't get in the way, fortunately. <laughs> Well, when you do the translation, do you translate it into modern French or do you try to make it a little bit more archaic in translation? That's a big issue. Um, right. We've, um, we've, this is a, a discussion. This is a choice we made. So we are trying to keep a sense of the past, but we're not doing it in an archaic manner. So we are, we are translating for for the community, for the stage, for so that the play gets across. Um, but it's a shame because it's a rhymed play and very often there are puns due to the rhyming patterns and things. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an issue also uh, in modern English and uh, Elizabethan or uh, early modern English. And of course, it's an issue in Japanese translation. Uh, of course, trying to to do that. Well, let's move on here to uh, cover uh, about the, well, there's a summer school here that a summer project that you have just finished or fairly recently finished. And I want to know what were the um, what were the goals? Uh, Lindsay, I'll start with you. What were the goals of this project? And uh, just tell us a little bit, describe what it was like. Yeah, so this is actually a really interesting um, kind of scheme that neither of us had really been aware of too much before um, we, we kind of got invited to, to, to join into this project. So there's um, Erasmus funding and, and for people outside of the EU, that's kind of the major funding that's used for European study abroad. Um, and I was familiar mostly with Erasmus funding in terms of students who are taking kind of a semester abroad in another EU country or a year abroad in another EU country. Um, but there's actually this scheme which is um, blended intensive programs, it's called, and it, it's, a, it's a newer addition to the Erasmus funding lineup. Um, and it's designed so that collaborators from different EU countries can sort of organize programs that, that involve kind of blended learning. Um, so there need to be kind of an online component um, where you have students from different EU countries kind of studying together online, and then they come together in person um, for kind of a shorter period. And, and often that manifests in things like summer schools. Um, so the summer school project that we're currently involved in right now um, it actually originated, um, kind of funnily enough, uh, with someone who, who is not um, in the EU at all. So Victoria Bladen, who's based in Australia, has been for many years um, kind of bringing Australian students on summer schools to various places in Europe. Um, but she then kind of was, was in touch with a colleague of ours who's based in Sardinia um, at, about maybe kind of having a, a summer school in Sardinia. And our Sardinian colleague then kind of became aware of the Erasmus BIP funding and thought like, well, why don't we make this bigger? Why don't we get Erasmus funding and bring in European partners um, in, in that way? So we, we kind of grew this, this network out. So it's, it's quite international, which is really exciting. Um, so we have um, students from Ireland, from, from my university, the University of Galway, um, and, and I'm teaching on, on it. Um, we have um, students from Montpellier in France. We have students from the Czech Republic who are participants. Um, we have also Italian students from, from Sardinia, um, the Australian students, who am I forgetting? Oh, Czech, Czech Republic. We have, we have colleagues and, and students from the Czech Republic involved as well. Um, and so the idea was was to all kind of come together um, in Sardinia, very atmospheric, and uh, and study the Tempest together for a week in in Sardinia. So there's a really great um, kind of international mix of students, international mix of teachers on the program. Um, 
And the, the program itself is, is really kind of fascinating because you've got all of those different kind of teachers coming from different contexts um, with different teaching styles and, and, and different kind of interests reflected in the program as well. Um, so it's a mixture of play readings, um, getting the students from, from kind of all over the world to, to actually read The Tempest together um, from start to finish and, and do a really comprehensive reading of the play in that way. Um, but then also kind of workshops on on various things involving kind of creative writing, um, some kind of more scholarly workshops as well. Um, and and then lectures from from the various teachers as well. So, I, I mean, it's a really, really kind of fun initiative and one that we're hoping will continue um, in, in kind of new iterations going into the future. Oh, good. Well, Agnes, what, how about what was you, what was your response to the planning and the um the, the, doing I, I guess the the um language is in English uh everyone speaks English is that it that's the idea yeah, yeah. so English yeah. is okay. working so, yeah that and was... you're you're doing the tempest on an island I don't know if yeah, you get exactly. a, the feel that you're on an island Sardinia is fairly large but I, I think you might get the feel that you're on an island there yeah well, working for a week, you know, uh, with nine colleagues in a wonderful environment like the Cittadella dei Musi in central Cagliari, excuse my Italian, uh, was, um, I mean, it's really, truly uplifting. Um, uh, the three Czech colleagues were really, uh, you know, they have a very innovative pedagogy. They use a lot um, uh, elements we don't usually use uh, I'm, a, I'm a more of a traditional lecturer so it's good for me to <laughs> to get acquainted with other ways of, of, of teaching English it was also interesting to uh, have the second language students mixed with uh, of course English speaking um, students so it's it's good for everyone uh, I think in terms of um, uh, community but I was also especially glad that this um, project allowed me to keep working uh, with uh, five of my French students who had been actively involved in the maids metamorphosis project in Montpellier and so the fact that um, this project came after the maids metamorphosis showed that we've we've been working together for a year but um, they, they didn't shy away from one more week, even though it's just a week, but still, I mean, it's outside the school calendar. It's They had to make time for it. It was end of June. And so um, this, um, uh, this reason makes me think that working on projects with students is, is really effective. And so the fact also that um, uh, um, the... Um, I mean, for financial reasons, it's difficult to now in, in France for French students to travel abroad. And so these uh, European schemes also are very important for to foster that sort of uh, sense of uh, being together on an island, as it were. And so the metaphor was nice, I thought. Yeah, well, what a what a wonderful opportunity for these students, but of course, for, for you guys also. But the uh, the idea of... It, of Sardinia, that it just it, it it's wonderful. The uh, new, not necessarily neutral, but uh, it's it's not Ireland, it's not uh, uh, Southern France. It's something new, right? So both of you could experience something th that uh, the, the newness of that, and of course the students who came in, right? It, it, it's a fairly exotic experience, and. Uh, uh, what a great thing. And you think it will go on in, into the future or something similar or it will grow into something else. Uh, and, and this is so important in our profession to engage students in this way. Uh, I wanted to uh, pivot back to Ovid a bit and and maybe pick both of your brains about this. I am convinced, and let's, I'll move to you, Lindsay. Uh, I'm convinced that the English dramatic renaissance, it used to be called more than early modern period, but something happened there. Something blew up around the 1570s that was sort of unprecedented. And I am thinking about Arthur Golding's translation of Ovid that came out in 1567. And I have worked on lost plays during that period with David McGinnis in uh, Melbourne and uh, or on that on that group. And I just, uh, in a nerdy way have tried to look and Ovid just keeps coming up and up and up. 
the plays are lost. You don't know exactly, but you know from the stories, from the titles, whatever, that they're just going into Golding and just pulling things out right off the bat. Now, have you seen that in your research? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting um, kind of question to think about what might have happened around that time, because I mean, certainly there, you know, Ovid, Ovid is always there to, to a certain extent, but there is a, a huge kind of, you know, increase in, in the interest um, in, in kind of popular Ovid, we might say, as, as you're getting towards kind of the end of the of the 16th century. And I think um, you know, increasingly, one of the things that I think um, both of us have become interested in, in part via the maid's metamorphosis a little bit, is actually the work of Lily, um, who's such a major figure in terms of, of kind of shaping in, in some ways, um, you know, early modern English drama. And he he's quite fascinating. And I, I guess I should maybe explain. So one reason why why we kind of got to Lily via The Maid's Metamorphosis is it, it's an anonymously written play, but it was, you know, many, many, many times it's been ascribed to Lily, although it's definitely not a work of Lily's. Um, and and it, it because it has some of those elements that people think of as being kind of characteristic of Lily, um, primarily a lot of Ovid. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you actually look at you know, Lily's surviving kind of body of, of dramatic works, um, it's it's incredible, you know, how many of them actually take really kind of direct and, and pretty obvious inspiration from Ovid's Metamorphoses. And, and in Lily's case, you know, probably not Golding's translation so much, um, but, you know, he, his play Midas, like very obviously, you know, in a Vidian play, loves metamorphosis. Um, you know, if you if you look through his dramatic works, it's 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 incredible, um, you know, how much he's really kind of drawing on that. And I, and I think in, in some ways, I mean, my kind of sense is that there was, you know, kind of some, something in the air. <laughs> Um, in this period and, and you know, possibly starting in, in kind of the 1560s or 1570s, where there is a lot of what we might think of as, as um, you know, sort of Ovid in, that, that's, you know, being really kind of circulated in these very popular forms. Um, so something else I've been very interested in, too, is broadside ballads mm -hmm. and particularly kind of looking at, um, you know, the the evidence is that there there are a lot of Ovidian broadside ballads and and again a lot of those are lost too but you can tell from kind of titles um but but also we do have some surviving 16th century examples of Ovidian broadside ballads um and and you know so so you you think about it and like that makes you know Ovid was literally in the air um yep. in in the 1560s 70s 80s before you even get to kind of the 1590s which is what we tend to think of when we're thinking about early modern drama more yeah cool. yeah I know Tiffany Stern well we talked very recently about her recent work on ballad she has a different she's going in a different direction but also it's all, always fascinating all of this is fascinating go uh, yes. Anya, so you you had a point, I think. That um, yeah, I I completely agree with uh, Lindsay of the sense of uh, of him being there all the time. Uh, one example in Maid's Metamorphosis is the use of echo. Um, the echo, uh, for me as a as an Ovidian scholar, immediately I was looking for the nymph, right? And so I've I've been studying that play. And bearing in mind all the French pastorals of the period, where you know the voice of the echo keep you know uh, uh, reverberating uh, everywhere and and being sort of a, a lamento. And I mean it, it's it's a poetic trope. It's a it's a cliche of the period, right? But in Maid's Metamorphosis, it becomes a joke. Um, and that's what we realized uh, with the Edwards boys uh, when they were asking us, how do, do we punctuate a line? Uh, at the end of the echo scene, Ascanio asks um, Joculo to, you know, keep quiet. He says, don't worry, boy. It is the echo boy. It is the echo boy. So how do you punctuate this? Do you keep uh, like a uh, capitalized E for echo or do you, is it just the echo? Go boy, and do you capitalize boy? So is Ascanio speaking to Joculo boy, keep quiet? Or is, is is it a new boy that is hiding in the woods and playing tricks and being, and of course it's a boy company. So they have boys 
hiding throughout the performance and, you know, shouting, Yurimini, Yurimini, looking for the little um, uh, Yurimini lost uh, somewhere. But this Yurimini, of course, is played by a boy. So, so you keep having those sort of uh, metatheatrical jokes, quite elaborate for for a little play understudied like this, quite effective on a modern audience because we got French students laughing at it is the echo boy. And you're like, wow. I mean, it's the magic of theater, right? It's a it's an Ovidian joke and people get it just because it works. So I think that the uh, outcome of the uh, of this research project was to to prove that that play can actually be understood by modern audiences, not just for the gender bending things, but also because we feel things similarly or we share experiences in a similar way, even if we're French. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I thought it was a, it was a great sort of experience and that was due to Ovid so I was very particularly glad yeah uh what comes what came to my mind and it depends on who is in this and how nerdy we are and where we've been but I was thinking about Lily it's it, it seems too late for Lily it could be a copycat person and there were some good dramatists out there who could carry that uh style uh, I was thinking of Galatia uh, when, you know, this uh, topic came up, I was thinking of uh, uh, As You Like It and uh, and also Twelfth Night, you know, these gender bending uh, episodes. And for people who might be listening, who don't, you're starting with a boy who starts out playing a girl, who transforms into a boy, who transforms back into a girl in this play. Uh, and I get confused with all this. Uh, so I won't go into the orders in the other plays, uh, but it, there is a Lily-esque uh, uh, thing going on here. But I think it, it goes straight through Shakespeare, too. Shakespeare, you know, of course, Juliet mentions Echo, so or Echo's Chamber. So, uh, mm. Anya, yeah. Yeah, um, sorry, I, I, I was kind of saying... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we, we've been we've been teaching. Um, both Lindsay and I have been teaching uh, the Maid's Metamorphosis even before there is an edition of it, uh, just because we were working on it and it was nice to be sharing with our students the fact that we were establishing an edition, and also we were testing the footnotes. <laughs> Where do we need footnotes? Um, we we. We need a bit of footnotes, um, but but at the same time, and not the same ones, of course, because my students are French and her students, of course, should have less problem with the English. Uh, apart from sometimes she says, no, you actually need to comment on this as well. Mm -hmm. So that that's also an interesting sort of conversation of having two editors from different perspectives, um, I think. In um, so so we're teaching uh, Made Metamorphosis explicitly with Galatea and Twelfth Night. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Lindsay. Nice I saw something in uh, in, in your uh, background. You've also looked into medieval Ovid, I believe, uh, and uh, I studied a little bit. I am kind of a dilettante on this, but I think there were, uh, the Ovid's Ars Amatoria, in particular, was it was brought up as it was a, a humorous tract as Ovid was writing it, or there was satire. It, it, it wasn't serious. This isn't really the art of love. But in the medieval times, when it was taken in, it was taken as a manual by, I guess, young men mainly, as the way to court. And there, there's a lot of humor in, in the, the, um, the, the idea of the art of love, right? And I wanted to see what, just kind of pick your brain and see what sort of things you've run, uh, run across in your medieval research as it goes into the early modern period with this idea of the art of love. Of course, we see it with Romeo uh, trying to be the, you know, the kind of the perfect lover or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting question. And and I have to say, like, I, I don't primarily identify as a medievalist, so I'll preface by saying that. Um, and like, I maybe if I, I could say a little bit about how I got drawn back into the medieval period more. Um, I, I started out, I guess, really identifying as as a 
primarily a 16th century um, person. And that that is really how I still kind of identify as, uh, you know, someone who's who's primarily interested in the 16th century. But um, I, I tend to be interested in, in some of the mid-century stuff, some of the early 16th century stuff as well. Um, and one of the things that I sort of increasingly became aware of, and this was not thinking so much about the amatory poetry, um, but, but thinking actually more about um, kind of the metamorphoses and, and the reception of that, I, I became increasingly aware, and also the Herodes, um, but I became increasingly aware thinking about this, that um, some of these really distinctive kind of 16th century interpretations of some of the Ovidian uh, sort of mythological material, um, you know, they can look kind of quirky um, in, in certain ways. And, and then if you kind of go a little bit further back, you can see that actually a lot of, especially kind of mid-Tudor, early Tudor authors are going to Chaucer um, for their information on Ovid. And so this was something that I became increasingly interested in is, you know, some of these, these kind of mythographical details that don't actually look strictly Ovidian, um, very often you can find them in Chaucer, um, who in turn is often, you know, drawing from Boccaccio or, and, and, and so you can kind of trace backwards um, and, and you can find some of these things that actually aren't necessarily classical details that kind of creep into that tradition of Ovid and, and you can trace a kind of longer lineage um, going back into medieval literature as well as mythography there. Um, and so that's something that, that kind of increasingly drew me actually into Chaucer, also Gower, um, thinking about kind of the, the vernacular English tradition um, that was, you know, very much um, still kind of a part of that that kind of knowledge about classical literature for the the early Tudor authors I mean Chaucer is still being reprinted all the time um in in the period and and a kind of a major mythological source actually in in really interesting ways um so that's kind of where where I've gone with my medieval work but um I, you know the re the reception of the amatory poetry which you're asking about is really quite interesting as well because I mean it it's part of the Ovidian canon um that I think sometimes gets overshadowed by you know in, in some ways the flashier um metamorphoses which is what we tend to think of these days when we're thinking about kind of Ovid and Ovidian poetry and I mean certainly the metamorphoses had a huge place in in early modern kind of culture and and kind of the cultural imagination as well. But um, so did some of those other Ovidian works, and and I think it is kind of important to to think about you know his reputation as the author of the things like the Tristia, you know, exile poetry, as as well as things like the Ars Amatoria, which is you know almost almost always um, once we get to the early modern period, you know, not actually thought of so much as as in, in that kind of maybe medieval sense as a kind of how-to manual as a, you know kind of something that, that's often dismissed um in, in in kind of interesting ways as being um you know wanton um and yet still like you can still find you know even, even as people kind of refer to it as the wanton poetry of Ovid um you know it's it still massively influences in indirect and indirect ways um you know just just the kind of the development of amatory poetry in English um more generally like you know you see things um if, if you're looking even at kind of Petrarchan tradition, you can see in, in all sorts of interesting ways how Petrarch and, 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 you know, his English imitators are very much kind of influenced by some of the things that get worked through in Ovid's Amores, for example. Um, so, you know, I think in, in indirect ways as well, you kind of see the lineage of that carrying through. Yeah, yes, yeah, so you, you get this, what would you call it? The stamp, the spirit, the imprimatur, something. You just, you can just follow this Ovidian influence all the way through. And I wanted to tie that with Southern France uh, and the go way before maybe, uh, but Eleanor of Aquitaine and bringing her poets to the court of Henry II, uh, the, the love poets, the, the love poetry and the sort of way it got into English culture and is still there when we're getting into more, more or less our period, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's a genealogy there or whatnot, but it's coming through Italy and France uh, primarily, 
right? This this Ovid, Ovidian thing, and of course, new stories from the continent mm. and poetry. Yes, Agnes. Yes, um, I I think um, what really interested me when I when I started on this trend of thinking about you know the fact that there is no rupture between the medieval period and the early Tudor period. There's really it's really a continuum in in the transmission of the classics because of these um, vernacular passages in these moments of of um, it's not straight Latin into English. Uh, it's it's it 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 goes through Europe, in fact, and we share that. And so I think it was really interesting because in France, um, the the scholarship was very much oriented towards, you know, the Protestant influence and the fact that uh, Northern Europe ties were Northern European ties were really important for English um, uh, development and uh, of the culture. But in fact, uh, um, Lindsay mentioned Boccaccio. I mean, Chaucer has been traveling to Italy. There's a whole and French, as you were mentioning, Tom. French is 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 everywhere. Everybody speaks French. So this sort of polyglot background is something that is now maybe a bit obscured by by the contemporary perspective. But that's something that's certainly true uh, in the period. So I think. Yeah, there was there were so many cases. There were so many cases. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's so many, but there are these cases where you see a story. I think Romeo and Juliet's um, one of them uh, translated. Uh, well, it's Italian, and it's, it's obviously maybe an Italian story that has a sort of Ovidian uh, texture to it, and translated into the French. And then you see it showing up uh, in uh, an English poem, you know, by Arthur Brooke and early on in uh, the Elizabethan period, uh, you, you just see these uh, kind of uh, ripples and waves going through the continent. And as you say, it, yeah, it isn't a straight uh, old Oxford graduate going in and translating uh, standard Latin text. You know, they, they were able to do it, but they were consulting uh, more than one language. It's wonderful to see. There is a sort of metamorphosis in that, isn't there? <laughs> you're right. Well, uh, Lindsay, let's talk about what you're doing now and what you're going to do in the future. And then uh, we'll go uh, to Agnes and, and uh, just tell us what's going on right now in terms of what you're working on. Sure. So I, I guess the main thing that, that uh, I'm kind of working on right now in terms of my own research is trying to finish off this collaborative project that we're doing on the Mates Metamorphosis. Um, so, you know, we, we saw um, these fantastic performances, um, this run in the UK and then France with the Edwards boys. Um, performing from from our modernized script um in March and then since then what we're really working on so our our edition is under contract now with the Revels Plays series um from Manchester University Press so um we we have the book contract we have we have a lot of work that has, has been done on it so we we still have a fair bit to do um for anyone who who has tried doing such a thing before you realize it, it, it's a project that expands and expands and expands um so it like really it's it's kind of finishing that off um beyond that i have another kind of major project that i'm involved with right now um, which is a Mary Curie doctoral training network. Um, it's called Remediating the Early Book, Pasts and Futures. Um, so it's a very large scale kind of project that is um, involving people from the University of Galway. Um, a colleague of, of mine and I here are working on it. We're actually the coordinating institution for, for this project. Um, and we're working with colleagues in Alicante, Antwerp, um, Bristol, Vienna, and Zurich. Um, we have 13 PhD students who are, um, they all began last September. They're on this network and they're all working on projects that relate to kind of either late medieval or early modern kind of book history, manuscript history, um, print culture, the transition between the two. Um, so 13 PhD students, three of them are based here in Galway. Um, and uh, we, we, the training network is kind of designed 
um, to train those students up together as a cohort in a, in a certain way. So it's fantastic for the students who are on the network. Um, we have kind of training activities that all of the different participating um, universities are organizing for them. We also have a whole range of industry partners, as, as they're called. Um, you don't often hear this in the humanities. Um, it's very much kind of a science model, this, this doctoral training network, but we, we've really kind of um, adapted ourselves to that. And, and thought really a lot about the question of, well, who are our industry partners if we're a group of medievalists and early modernists? Um, and, and we discovered that there are things like libraries, um, museums, auctioneers, booksellers. Um, so we have a whole kind of international European um, kind of cohort of, of industry partners who are, who are kind of part of the project as well and offering internships to all of the PhD students on the training network. So um, that's that's kind of a, a, the other massive project that I'm involved with at the moment. Oh, that's just wonderful. Well, Agnes, what, how about you? What is, what's yeah, going on now? Uh, well, I've... Uh, I'm also very busy with maze metamorphosis. We we still, it's it's very much on my desk um, too. Uh, but I'm also engaged in the. I'm the co-editor with uh, Charlotte Coffin uh, from University of uh, Paris Créteil uh, in the third volume in a Breppel series entitled Polyglot Encounters in Early Modern uh, Britain. Mm -hmm. And so it's a series. Uh, it's a Breppel series for which we're doing a polyglot pages. In early modern England, so it's a it's a volume. Um, Charlotte and I, Charlotte is also um, in the field of classical reception, and because we've been working uh, um, with translations, compilations, and treatises, we, we've been uh, revolving around mythological material. We, we've been seeing that you know um, it didn't all translate into English, but it. It led to polyglossia, so we are familiar with the circulation of myths. And we thought about um, putting up a proposal about the mise en page of polyglossia. So how uh, polyglot pages are um, uh, traveling um, to England, uh, what kind of polyglot volume apart from polyglot Bibles, of course, but there are many other or polyglot manuals, um, language manuals, but there are also polyglot manuscripts, um, in fact. And so the, the how does the diverse levels of text and commentary sort of um, uh, appear on the page? So it's about materiality. And um, we're, we're using uh, Anne Coldiron's uh, book, Printers Without Borders, which is a, a great um, inspiration, and also uh, Rachel Stenner's on the typographic imaginary. So it's also a project on book history. Um, uh, in the sense, uh, just like um, you were describing, uh, Lindsay, and um, and so it's kind of a historical. It's it's going to be a okay. We we just we're getting the ten chapters now. We're rereading them. That's the stage we are at. Um, but so we have historical chapters uh, about the material modalities of uh, polyglossia. We also have literary chapters of how it works uh, on the page and how readers um, engage with those texts. And if the, those texts are specifically um, teaching or how they are specifically teaching or engaging with the reader's uh, minds. So, so that's what we're doing. Writers, printers, engravers, readers, everybody around the book uh, and staging that polyglossia. That's the project and it's going, it's due next year. So we are. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> That's wonderful. What I'm hearing from both of you is this sense that we're starting out with people on the outside looking in at at you, uh, you, you two and me often too. Uh, sometimes it seems that the driest, the most boring things are the most attractive things to, to us. And I, I love talking to textual editors about this because in every conversation I have with textual editors, it always leads out to something else. You find out the person is involved actively in the theater uh, there's an adventure that's being done, and and this is being played out here. And both you built uh, with the summer school, you built with this project on the maid's metamorphosis. Uh, in both cases, an, an adventure has come from it. You know, whether you end up in Sardinia, where it, there's travel, there's uh, there's intellectual exchange, 
their are plays, their engagements with people internationally and across languages and cultures. And this is exciting stuff. It's all extremely exciting. Um, well, what I would like to do is uh, ask you if there's anything else you would like to add about what's what's happening, what's going on. If not, then uh, I'm going to thank you. Uh, thank you very kindly. But l anything else? I mean, I just, I guess in closing, I might just kind of pick up on, on what you just said there. I mean, I think one of the things that's been really interesting to me as my career has developed is, you know, I think so many of us who, who go into academia, you start out with this vision that it'll be great because you can just work by yourself in a library and everyone will leave you alone. <laughs> um, and, and, but I, I do think, you know, I'm, I'm sort of kidding, but I, I think a lot of us start out, you know, very much, you know, with this idea, certainly in the humanities that you're going to work alone. And that's what it means to be a researcher in, in the humanities. And I, I guess one of the things that I've increasingly learned as my career develops is that some of the most exciting things that you can do are actually, by reaching out to people and and making those kind of international connections with other people and being really creative and thinking about like what can we build what what can I bring what can you bring um and and that's where you know I found increasingly like that's where the really exciting kind of things happen. Yes. Agnes, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, well, I, what I what I really like is meeting my colleagues and also um, having my students around and uh, them seeing some hope because I find they're really um, they're really worried about their future. Uh, they're very sad. They're very I don't know. Um, I've I found uh, I find that when we share something, when we work together on something, then we can achieve something. And so that's what I want to to do. And uh, when I can do it with international colleagues, all the all the better. Then we show it's possible to do it. That's what we need to to do. I think so. Yeah. I agree. I started yeah. on my own and I'm yeah. not on my own anymore. <laughs> well, that's one of the things that spawned this series. Uh, the, the, the whole idea of uh, coming into contact with people who are not uh, down the hall from you. Of course, during the pandemic, we couldn't even talk with those people. Uh, and we realized how much we missed the uh, uh, conversations that we we're having uh, because they spawned so many ideas. And uh, it's why we go into this to, to have these conversations uh, and this is the first time I've uh, done three people, and it's, it worked out ex extraordinarily well. I didn't want to let you go without letting both of you know. Now, uh, Lindsay, I didn't know you, but uh, in 2019, I was in Galway, and oh. uh, and I didn't know you, and I was just traveling through with my wife, and and uh, I it was the first time I'd been to Galway since 1978. I was alive then. And uh, and able to travel and walk and all that stuff, and um, it, I could not believe the transformation. Uh, and I liked the Galway of '78. It was a lot of fun. There were some good bands, you know, playing some you know traditional music. But then I went and so where is oh my goodness? It was beautiful, and and of course of course we had beautiful weather uh, the whole time. And you have the cliffs of Mora there. You have a, a kind of um, uh, Ramblas, uh, like they say in uh, Barcelona, uh, an area you walk the streets that you walk down is so much fun, but a uh, beautiful town. And of course, I visited Montpellier very re recently and got to meet you guys over there. And that's, again, another sort of, it's a boom town. I don't think Galway's a boom town, but it's just a transformed, sort of Ovidian town. It's a transformation <laughs> took place in Galway. And Montpellier is a boom town, you know, and I know uh, that Agnes, you did some work in Texas and uh, it showed it when I came to Montpellier, I think this is reminding me of these, you know, things that happened to the towns in Texas, like uh, recently Austin, where you spent some time, uh, people discovered uh, your area, but it's just beautiful there. And so I guess you could clip this out and give it to your chamber of commerce. But uh, Lindsay, <laughs> you're you're American, right? You were American born uh, and then made your way yeah. there. Yeah, no, I, I um, 
I'm from Maine originally, and I grew up in Maine, but then I, I actually haven't lived in America since the 1990s, yeah. um, which might say something about my age. Um, but uh, no, I, I left to America in, in 1999 um, and haven't lived there since. Um, I did all of my university education in Canada, actually, and then came to Ireland via Turkey. So I worked yeah. at a Turkish university for yeah. three years before I came to Galway. So I've been around. <laughs> uh, and Agnes, you, I, I forgot your background, if you have always been in Montpellier or not. I don't think so. Well, I, I, I haven't always been in Montpellier, but I've always been in the south of France, I'm sorry. So I was previously in Toulouse, which is about a two hour and a half drive. So I just moved closer to the Mediterranean because my, my second, yeah, I like sailing also. And I, you know, <laughs> uh, there's a good argument uh, for, you know, being born in the south of France and staying there. Uh, for anyone who has not been to the south of France, it's very beautiful, but also, of course, the uh, uh, Galway. And and I could give a shout out to Tokyo, too. But um, anyhow, uh, thank both, I, I thank both of you so much for coming on to this you. series and sharing your work with us. This is precisely what I wanted to do uh, in this conversation. And you've been so uh, wonderful in being able and and. Uh, You've clarified a lot of stuff for me and I'm sure uh, viewers of ours. So thank you again so much. Thank you thank for you having for us. Having us.